All right, let's talk about nuclear reactions and binding energy. So up to now, we have learned about radioactive decay, the reactions involved in radioactive decay. We learned about half-lives, but we still don't quite understand why the nucleus is being held together to begin with. Remember I showed you that we calculated the force of electrostatic repulsion between protons in the nucleus, and we found that it's really, really high. So we're still trying to figure out what is going on inside of the nucleus that holds it together, something called binding energy. Okay, so binding energy is a term we use to define the amount of work that we have to do to separate all the nucleons in a nucleus. If we're able to start to understand that, maybe we can start to pick apart uh, what is it that holds the nucleus together. So the big question that everyone had when they designed the nuclear model, Rutherford's nuclear model, was what holds the nucleus together to begin with? And people came up with the idea that, well, you can calculate the force, so the force must be very strong, and it must be a strong force that is limited to the size of the nucleus. The size of the nucleus is 1 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, so there must be some type of forces that are acting inside of the nucleus that don't act anywhere else. And they called that force the strong force. It's a force that acts at a very small distance, 1 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, the strong force. Okay, but we can't get in there with our sensors, like our dual range force sensor that we have in the lab. So the only way we can get an idea about it is to see if we can measure the energy when a nucleus explodes. Okay, and then that way we can go backwards and find the binding energy that is inside. And the energy, remember, is force times distance. That gives us an idea about the force, the magnitude of the force holding a nucleus together. So let's try to figure out the first part in your text on page... Uh, 285 of Tsokos, it has a really nice explanation of how they determine the magnitude of binding energy without measuring the force. And a lot of people, when they were looking at atoms, started coming up with some interesting anomalies. Okay, so something strange happens to the mass inside of a nucleus. When I look at the mass of the particles that make up the nucleus, it kind of doesn't give me the same answer when I look at different atoms. So let's take a look. Okay, the thought experiment. Let's calculate the mass of each individual nucleon in a nucleus. Okay, and in your textbook and in your data booklet, you'll see, whoops, you'll see a unit called atomic mass unit, okay, U. And it says beside it, uh, one atomic mass unit is 1.6605402 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. What that is supposed to represent is that is the mass of a nucleon in a nucleus. So that's the mass of a single nucleon, a proton or a neutron, in a nucleus. Okay, that was our original idea. And where that came from was the fact that everything on the periodic table is related to carbon-12. So all the atomic mass numbers, all these atomic mass units, are, related, are a ratio of the mass of carbon-12. Okay, or better yet, one-twelfth the mass of carbon-12. Remember, carbon-12 has 12 nucleons. So if I just divide the mass of a carbon-12 atom by 12, I should get that. And that would be what everyone thought would be the mass of a proton and the mass of a neutron. And so theoretically, 1 12th is the mass of a proton and a neutron. So let's go through that calculation. Where did they get this number? Okay, so what you got to do first is you take carbon-12 has an atomic mass of 12 grams per mole. That's what you'll see on the periodic table. So if I divide 12 grams by Avogadro's number, which is the number of atoms in a mole, that's going to give me 1.99 times 10 to the minus 23 grams per atom. Okay, so if you take 12 grams divided by that number, it gives you that's the mass of a single atom. Okay, and a carbon-12 atom has 12 nucleons. So if I want to find out the mass of an individual nucleon, I'll take that number and I'm going to divide it by 12. Okay, so the mass of a single nucleon is that number divided by 12, which gives me that in grams. But remember, in physics, we want to convert that to kilograms. So if I divide that number by 1,000, I get 1.6606 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay, so one atomic mass unit is equal to 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay, but that's not the same as that. Oh yeah, because... Carbon also has 12 electrons, so I have to subtract 12 electrons, the mass of 12 electrons. Each electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. 
Okay, and that would give me one atomic mass unit being 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So everybody thought that a proton and a neutron has that mass. But then if you just go over to hydrogen, okay, hydrogen is just made of a proton. So theoretically, if I did the same thing with hydrogen, and I found out what the mass of the proton and hydrogen would be, so here I go, 1.01 grams per mole divided by Avogadro's number gives me that, okay? And then if I divide that by 1,000, and then I subtract the mass of an electron, I get this number. So if I look at hydrogen, hydrogen says that the mass of a nucleon or the mass of a proton is 1.67627 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. But our calculation with carbon said it's 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27. Something's weird. How did it change? Okay, so the mass of a proton is that, but the mass of a nucleon is that. That got people thinking. Where did that extra little bit of mass go? Okay, so something doesn't add up, okay? There's a mass difference between unbound and bound nucleons. That's what they said, okay? As soon as you start binding them together, you lose, you lose some mass. And they called that term the mass defect, okay? So the mass that you lose when nucleons bind together is called the mass defect, okay? So later on, with a lot of experiments, they were able to find that the mass of a proton... Okay, and they're all actually also able to determine the mass of free neutrons. Okay, and you can find this inside of your data booklet. Usually it's relative to you, like the mass of a neutron is like 1.008 U or something like that. Okay, so you can take a look inside. But so it's just a little bit larger. Both of them are a little bit larger. The mass of a proton is like 1.007 or 1.006 U. They're a little bit larger than the mass of the bound atomic mass unit, the bound nucleon. So the fact that they're larger is strange. When you put them into the nucleus and bind them together, they lose mass, and that's called the mass defect. Okay. So what that mass defect got everyone questioning, except for this guy, Einstein. And Einstein came up with uh, an explanation for the mass defect, and he said that that mass is being sacrificed Okay, that difference in mass when it binds in a nucleus is being sacrificed. That mass defect is being sacrificed and being turned into binding energy, which is really weird. How can matter become energy? It doesn't make any sense, right? But according to Einstein and his theory of relativity, matter can interconvert between energy and matter. So that's kind of cool. So matter is being sacrificed. If I find the total mass in kilograms that has been sacrificed, and I multiply it by the speed of light squared, that should give me the binding energy of the nucleus, which is going to be what we're going to be talking about in the next video. Okay, we're going to use this formula to calculate the binding energy of different nuclei and try to explain why a radioactive isotope like uranium falls apart, whereas iron doesn't. We're going to be looking at the binding energy available in that nucleus.